Hey YouTube, welcome to the next episode on differentiation. I think we're on episode seven now. It's a lot of episodes on differentiation. Such a huge topic. So now we're on second derivatives. Now this is really important that we fundamentally understand what second derivatives measure. So let's get right to it in terms of notation first. So if dy by dx is the first derivative of y, what will the second derivative be? Now just to clarify some notation here. If you take y and you want to find its gradient, you do d by dx of y. Then algebraically, we write as dy by dx. Now, if we want to differentiate this again, we are taking d by dx of dy by dx. Then the notation for this is d times d is d squared, y by, then we have dx pi sorry, dx times dx, well, it's the same thing, so we say dx squared. So if the first derivative is dy dx, the second derivative is d squared, d squared y by dx squared. And what we're doing is we are differentiating the gradient. Now, state the notation for f of x. Well, if we have f of x and we differentiate that with respect to x, then we get f dash x. Or another way you could say is f prime x. Then when we differentiate that again, I think you can expect uh, the answer here. We would have two dashes. So we can use those interchangeably. Uh, some students ask me what about um, dots on the y. So something like if you have y, what does y dot mean? And what does y double dot mean? I would say with these, be very careful. These are mostly used in, in mechanics and physics. The dots on top really means with respect to t. So y dot would actually mean dy by dt. So I'd say be careful of using dots interchangeably with pure mass. Um, just keep those or leave those separate to mechanics. So we need to understand what the second derivative actually means geometrically. So let's observe our favorite graph that we've been using this whole time from previous lessons. We can see that there are local minimums. Now I put local in a bracket because this one over here is a local minimum, but this one, this minimum here is actually the global minimum. It's the lowest point of our graph. Then up here, we have our local maximum. Last lesson, we described why that's a local maximum. Now, what is special about the second derivative at these points? So let's talk about the minimums first. Now, remember what we said? We said that the second derivative is the gradient of the gradients, right? Now, what does the gradient measure? It measures the rate of change. So this is measuring the rate of change of the gradients. Now, let's just take some points around our minimum here, 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 here. And we observe the gradients at those points. Remember, the gradient is equivalent to the gradient of the tangent at that point. So here, if we draw a tangent, 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 tangent. What could you tell me about the gradients as we go along? Well, here you can see that the gradients are negative and here they are positive, right? So it must mean that the gradients are increasing in value, yeah? So for minimums, the gradients increase in value. So if someone was to say then, what's the rate of change of the gradients then? Well, the changes are positive because you're increasing in value. Well, that must mean then that the second derivative, the one that measures the rate of change of gradients, must be positive. And you must remember that for minimums, minimums, I've spelt that uh, as like an abbreviated statement. So minimums, the second derivative is positive. And what about maximums? I guess you can expect the answer here. But if we were to just do some points on around our maximum, you can see that the tangents are going from positive to negative, meaning that they're getting smaller. So if someone was to say, okay, well, what's the rate of change of the gradients there then? Well, if you're going from positive to negative, they must be getting smaller. So the gradients are decreasing in value. Well, if they're decreasing in value, the rate of change must be 
negative, they are getting smaller. We're subtracting from those gradient values to go from positive to negative. So we need to remember for maximums, the gradient or the second derivative is negative. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the video. If you're new here and you want more maths content, then please consider subscribing. If you're learning something, then hit that like button and comment down below to let me know what you want to learn next. I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. Now, this is a very important part of our theory is inflection points. Now, what does it mean to be an inflection point? At a point of inflection, you can see that the graph is neither maximum or a uh, minimum. But the gradient is still zero here. So just to clarify, this is a stationary point of inflection. So you can see there it's going flat, but we can't classify what's going on there because if we were to just draw some points on either side and draw tangents, you can see that the tangents here are positive. They go zero, but they're still positive. So if someone was to say, okay, well, what's the rate of change of the gradient then? You wouldn't be able to say in terms of using our logic from the last um, slide. So here, it is the case that the gradients aren't technically changing. Yeah, they're going from positive to positive. Yeah, so in a nutshell, the rate of change of the gradients, well, they aren't changing. So the second derivative is zero. But we need to be very, very careful with this statement. Yeah, there's some uh, rules we have to stick by because of this whole, you know, going from positive to positive, the second derivative being zero. We need some more um, detail here. The second derivative is actually not enough to determine whether your point is a stationary point of inflection. In fact, if you do find the second derivative to be zero, it could be any of a minimum, maximum, or an inflection point. Now keep in mind the condition here is that we have already found dy by dx is zero. We've already found the location of the stationary point. But if dy by dx is zero, and then you find the second derivative to be zero, then it could be anything, a minimum, maximum or an inflection point. So essentially what I'm saying here is that if the second derivative is zero, it doesn't necessarily imply an inflection point or a stationary point of inflection. So here's the real definition of a point of inflection, not necessarily um, a stationary point. So a point of inflection is the point on a curve where it changes in concavity, i.e. from concave to convex, and vice versa. So if you look at this graph, the way I like to describe it is this. Say you're a car and you're over here. Yeah, it's a really bad car, but you're driving this way. Yeah. As you go along, yeah, hopefully you guys have maybe driven some bumper cars or something and you understand what's going on here. Which way would you be turning your steering wheel? Well, I hope if you use some logic here, if you're that car and you're going this way, you'd be turning your steering wheel to the right. Yeah? If you keep going, you're going to be turning right. Yeah? But then if you are over here, say the car's over here now, and you're turning this way, which way would your steering wheel be turning? Well, in this section, your steering wheel will be turning left. Now, you need to think, if you're turning your steering wheel right, and then eventually you're turning it left, where must that steering wheel have been? Well, eventually, between that right and left turn, it must have been centered. And that is an inflection point. Yeah, when your steering wheel is centered. Yeah, so your car is literally driving straight only at that small, infinitely small second of driving. Yeah, so an inflection point is when a, you can think of it in terms of the steering wheels, that's the, um, the non-mathematical way of classifying an inflection point. But, you learn more about this in year 13, but as we're turning right here, the graph is said to be concave. And then as we are turning left, this is convex. Yeah, I like to think of it as it's making this kind of V shape. Yeah. And concave is kind of caving in. Yeah, it's turning in on itself. Yeah, if you were to keep turning right, you would turn in on itself. That's just how I remember. Now, what's special about this is that the second derivatives are changing in value. So at this maximum, remember, at a maximum, the second derivatives are negative, right? 
So on this section here, the second derivative, d2y by dx squared, would be negative. And then over here, the second derivative would be positive. So for an inflection point, it's just changing in that concavity. So yes, the second derivative here would be zero. But that's just the definition of an inflection point. We are speaking specifically about stationary points of inflection. So in that situation, in the next lesson, I'll give you examples where I'll show you why the second derivative being zero is not enough. If we do come across a situation then where we found dy by dx is zero and we found the second derivative to be zero, how do we then prove what it is? So we've already satisfied in this case, dy by dx is zero, and we have the second derivative is zero. And we're saying, okay, well, what do we do then? We, we think it's an inflection, but we don't know. But what you do is you come to the graph. Here, I've indicated that this stationary point is at zero. Yeah, so you found the second derivative at zero. Uh, sorry, you found that the first derivative is zero at x is zero. Yes, yeah, so there's a stationary point there. But you've also found that the second derivative is zero at zero. So what we do then is we check the gradients on either side of the graph. So at x is zero here, what we'd do is we'd check x equals minus one and check x equals one. And we'd check the gradients on either side. And what you notice here is that it's positive, positive. So for an inflection point, the gradients on either side of the stationary point need to be the same. They could have also been negative, negative. How would it look for a minimum? Well, at a minimum, say you had your x equals 0 here. At x is minus 1 and x is 1, what you'll notice is that x is minus 1, you have a negative gradient. Then remember here it goes flat. Then at 1, you would have a positive gradient. So if it goes from negative to positive, you have a minimum. And then the opposite is true. If you have a uh, positive gradient, then flat, then negative, you would have the uh, maximum classification here. And you only need to do this if you find that the second derivative is zero. You need to check the gradients on both sides. So here you have your minimum, here you have your maximum. So just to summarize, guys, I'm going to do some more examples in the next episode. But if you have a stationary point at x equals a, some just point on the x-axis, if the second derivative is positive, you have a local minimum. If the second derivative is negative, then you have a local maximum. If the second derivative is zero, then it could be any type of point. So we resort to checking gradients on either side of the stationary point. And one thing to make sure is that when you do check points on either side, make sure you don't go too far away from your um, point, uh, your stationary point. Because if you go too far, you may go past another point, another stationary point, and then it causes a big mess. So make sure the points you do choose on either side are quite close to your um, original stationary point. So that's it, guys. All I've shown you today is what second derivatives are and how we use them to classify turning points on our graphs. Make sure you stay tuned to the next episode where I'm going to show you some examples and also we can use these to sketch our functions as well. So I look forward to it. Guys, if you learned something, please hit that like button and subscribe if you want more maths content. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Peace.